guys in other seats. What is up, everybody? Honestly, I had no idea what to do while you guys were singing that. I was like, do I just look down at my notes, or do I just like stare at you kind of awkwardly? Thank you for that. Yep, 26 today. Feel I'm eight years older than some people in the room, which is kind of crazy. Um, what did you guys think about Chris's feeding two birds with one scone joke? I noticed you guys didn't think that one was too funny. You guys should think about that one. That one's pretty clever. Um, anyways. If you're new here, my name's Cole. Um, I get the pleasure of getting to hang out with you guys, work here on Salt Staff, get to preach sometimes. It's a blast. Um, and we are in the middle of going through a series titled The Road to Emmaus, where we are looking at how the Old Testament set the stage for Jesus to come to earth and how the story of the Bible is the story of Jesus coming to die for sinners. And so that's kind of the aim of what we're doing in this series. And so for tonight, Here's a question I want to start with. Have you ever bought or signed up for something and it didn't come as planned, but like in a negative way? So you're like, I'm going to do this thing, I'm going to get this thing, and then it arrives and you're like, this kind of sucks. Um, so for me, uh, context, it's December of my freshman year of college. I'm living in Burge, enjoying the dining hall, and I go home for Christmas. My family posts a picture of me on Facebook. And the picture is extremely unflattering. I felt very insecure when I saw this picture. And so what I decided to do was that I was going to run a marathon because I was going to shed that weight. And I was like, what better way to do this than to do something that surely can't be that hard? And, you know, I'm a big fan of the Rocky movies. And so, you know, you see all like the training montages and you're like, how hard can it be, you know? So it's not that hard for the first couple miles, and then as you continue to train, it gradually got harder and harder. As the distances got longer, the toll on my body got greater. And during the actual race, about 15 miles in, my legs just started to shut down, and I had to power walk like an idiot <laughs> the rest of the marathon, and people are like asking me if I'm okay. Me running a marathon was not what I anticipated it to be. I imagined what crossing the finish line would be like, but I didn't really know what all the steps to get there would be. And so here's my question and why I ask that. Has your Christian life felt like that at times? Right? You had this expectation for what it would be. You came to Salt or wherever it was that you got saved. You saw a bunch of happy people. You found community. You loved it. You gave your life to Jesus. But as you grew in your Christian walk, you saw that the Bible has a lot to say about a lot of things that our sinful flesh loves to indulge in. And that could be anything, right? Anything the Bible speaks against that we just so badly want to live out. And over time, as you've tried to live more in step with God's design for your life, it's felt less like the invitation to joy that you were promised that it was and more like an invitation to say no to a lot of things that you really want to do. So when you think of your Christian life, is it marked by chains and bondage, or is it marked by refuge and happiness? And that's kind of the big question that we're working with tonight. When you think of your Christian life, is it marked by chains and bondage, or refuge and happiness? And the thing we're going to see as we're opening up Psalm 2 is that Jesus is on the throne, and a lot of people don't like it. So if you guys want to flip there, or otherwise it'll be on the screen, Psalm 2, verse 1 through 4, David writes, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ro ropes off of us, they say. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. 
So for context, like I said, this is King David writing about something that he is observing in the world around him, and he is wondering something. And what he's wondering is why is he seeing so much rebellion in mankind from people towards God? Why does he see these nations and these kings and these people rejecting the God who made them and the God who invites them into fellowship with him? And he's seeing a lot of people doing these things, but he's like, it's all in vain. They're doing it for nothing. And so what this makes me think of is, I don't know if any of you guys, you know, on the whole, like, I don't know if you guys have seen, like, the prep, punk, jock, nerd scale thing. If you haven't, come up and talk to us afterwards. We'd love to talk to you about it. Um, So I was always super preppy growing up. So naturally, what I did was I ran for student council in elementary school, of course. And if you're familiar with some of the things, the common tropes for student council candidates in elementary school, if you can remember all the way back then, one of the ones was always we're going to make school lunches free, or we're going to get more recess time, and we're going to get less homework, and you're going to make all these promises of things. We're always plotting for free lunches. But actually, it's in vain, right? Because if you're in elementary school and you're in student council, you don't actually have any authority over the economy of lunch prices. (laughs) Everybody knows that, except for elementary schoolers. And so we promise things that we can't deliver, We promise to do things that we can't do. And effectively, that's the same thing that David is saying is happening here. He's like, I'm seeing all these people, all these finite mortal people, waging war against the king of the universe. Right? That's the contrast between verse 2 and verse 4, where he says the kings of the earth versus the one who is enthroned in heaven. We are finite, but God is infinite. And the people who are rebelling against God are working in vain because they are humans who can't stand against him. They'll stand no chance against him. But this shows something about people. And the thing it shows us is that it is in our nature to want to rebel against God. If you spend any time here, that's something we talk a lot about. That's what sin does. It wants us to reject God and to live in our own lordship, our own kingship over our lives, to deny him, to reject him, to think that our self-determination is more definitive than God's sovereign control and sovereignty. And so here's my question for that. Who do you think wins in a battle? The God who created the universe and everything in it, or me, whose afternoon gets thrown off by someone driving slow in the left lane? Right? That's how we view it. It's like, oh, I can stand up against God. I know what's better for my life than God. Meanwhile, you know, something as silly as that can just throw off our entire days. And so no matter how many of these people who are annoyed at slow left lane drivers pool together and bring their power together to wage war against God, it'll never stand a chance. It's a futile Effort because we are temporary vapors on this earth, but God is infinite and eternal. And we're going to talk more about what that rebellion actually means in a minute, a little bit later in the sermon. But here's the thing I want to draw your attention to. And the real problem and how that relates to our question about how you view your Christian life is this, is why does humanity and people in our sinful flesh, why do we feel the need to rebel in the first place? Why, when God says something to us that goes against the grain of what we want to do, do we think that it's our way or the highway, that we know what's best? Why do we think that God is someone to be overcome, whether we say it like that or not? And the answer to that is because, like verse 3 says, we tend to view following Jesus And our sinful flesh, this is like the temptation that we have to view it as a place of chains and bondage rather than the place of freedom that the Bible often talks about. That's what sin does. It tells us that God is restricting our joy. That's what Genesis 3 did. If you flip there, we're not going to actually go over that, but the serpent, that's the very first sin 
is he convinces Adam and Eve, man, God doesn't want you to do this thing because he knows that if you do it, you'll be like him. To tell them that their joy is being hindered. Sin says that if you listen to what God has to say about your life, then you are sacrificing joy. And maybe some of you at times, especially when you're in college, especially if you're living in the dorms or if you're living with people who are living out all sorts of sin, who don't love Jesus, maybe some of you are feeling the temptation that it would be easier if I wasn't a Christian so that I could do blank. Right? If I didn't have this rule over my life, then my life would be better. Or I'll follow Jesus as long as he doesn't try to change blank. Right? As long as Jesus doesn't touch this part of my life, then I will follow him. And here's my question to that. If you're feeling that temptation, or if you do feel that temptation, especially as so many people are going on spring break here, here's my question to that. Is, are you sure that it's God who puts chains and ropes on us? And here's why I ask that. So about a month ago, um, I got an email um, about a guy who was in the hospital who needed a hospital visitation. Um, they didn't know where he was at with the Lord. They didn't know um, if he was saved or not. But what they did know is that he was dying soon. Um, and so I got there. And what I found out was that this man had struggled his entire life with substance abuse, alcoholism, other substances. And finally, he was dying from liver disease as his body was rejecting the lifetime of indulgence that he had done. And not only was he dying, but he was leaving three daughters behind. And it's one of those situations where I even have goosebumps right now talking about it, because when you go to something like that, you're like, what do you say in a situation like that? Romans 6.12 says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey its desires. The aim of sin is your life. It's your death. And so while it tries to tell you that following Jesus is where chains and bondage are found, we need to know, and this is the first point of the sermon, kind of answering that question, is don't let sin distort reality. Don't let sin distort what is actually true. Sin always tells us that freedom is found in rebelling against God, but the end goal of sin is your destruction and death and as much pain and suffering as it can bring. That is what's true. So here's the question then. If you're a Christian, you're trying to live your life, you're trying to follow Jesus as best as you can, you're trying to fight your sin, the question is, how do I know if I'm a person of spiritual, or if I'm in a season of spiritual dryness, right? Like, Jesus doesn't feel as on fire to me as he's felt in the past. I don't know if I'm in one of those seasons, spiritual dryness, or I'm letting sin distort how I view following Jesus, and that's why it doesn't feel like I'm as fi on fire as I have been in the past. Has sin changed how I view following Jesus? So here's the distortion test. Here's how you can tell if sin has distorted how you view the world around you. How do you respond when Scripture confronts you on your sin? When the Bible says something about the way that you're living your life or about the way that you're wanting to live your life, how do you respond? What's the natural inclination of your flesh? All right, so some examples might be... Um, how do you respond when scripture confronts you on living with your significant other before marriage? All right, that's a, almost something that's just taken as a given that we do that in our culture now. But the Bible actually has a lot to say about that. Hebrews 13 says that we are to keep the marriage bed holy. All right, so when the Bible says stuff like that, are you like, man, I want to live in Jesus' lordship over my life because I know that that's best? Or are you like, no, nope, don't want anything to do with that. That's an example. Another example might be, um, how do you respond when Scripture confronts you on drunkenness or going out or underage drinking or whatever it is? Do you receive that as like, man, God is giving me a guide, in, a guide to life and what's truly life? 
Or is that a hindrance to your true joy because everybody else is doing it, including your friends? Or, and this one might strike, you know, us people pleasers in the crowd. How do you respond when the Bible says things about cultural sins that people hate and somebody asks you about it? When the Bible confronts your people pleasing. When the Bible confronts my people pleasing. And you're looking at somebody who's going to be really mad if you believe what the Bible says. How do you respond in that moment? Sin tells us that freedom is found in what brought death and bondage and chains in the first place. And that's kind of the twisted irony of what it promises us. Is if you come to me, you will have life, but really it's sin that invited death into the world in the first place. So if we want to not let sin distort our reality, if you don't want to be fooled and duped by sin into choosing that which is death, here's a practical application. You guys ready for this? Psalm 19, um, verse 7 through 13. I've got to flip to it here real quick. It's also going to be on the screen, I think. Um, <clears throat> this is another Psalm of David. David says this, and this was actually the thing that totally changed my view of how I read the Bible. Because before it was just a thing that you did, but this actually made it be like, man, this is like the best part of my day. Starting in verse 7, David says this, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant, us, is warned by these commands, and in keeping them there is abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me, Lord, from my hidden faults. Moreover, Keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. So if you want to not be lied to and confused by sin, then what you need to do is invite God's word to confront your life. Am I living in the freedom that this book promises or am I living in the chains and bondage that this world promises? Even if it doesn't call it that. Even if it calls it liberation. Let God's word be your true north in your day-to-day -day life. Spend time steeped in God's word and enjoy him in it. Because that is a book that is true. So continuing on, verse 4, we're going to reread that because it'll kind of set the stage for um, the next little part here. Verse 4 through 9, David continues in Psalm 2. It says, the, Lord, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter, and you will shatter them like pottery. So here's something that's true, is that most people aren't opposed to the idea of God. All right, I talk to people all the time who love the idea of spiritualism, of there being some sort of higher power. Most people aren't opposed to the idea of God what people do tend to be opposed to is when God starts doing things. When God starts acting, when God starts saying things. That's where the opposition comes, and that's what we see here. People weren't opposed to the idea of God. They were opposed to God's anointed one. The king that he had put on the throne, which David here is a shadow of, and which Christ is the fulfillment of, which has been our continual theme throughout this Road to Emmaus series which means that if they were opposed to God's anointed one, then they were opposed to God himself. And what, what, and God has anointed 
I totally just stumbled in my notes there. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> God has anointed this person to be king and king of the whole earth. That's what verse 8 tells us. And what this reveals about verse 3, when it talks about ripping off these chains and these ropes of bondage, is that it's not actually about freedom that our sin is like working to get us to believe. It's not about freedom. It's actually about lordship. Because we hate that God has put someone on the throne that isn't us. We ourselves want to be lord of our lives, which means it's offensive to our flesh if there is a king installed over us namely Jesus, as the true king. And so maybe you think that I'm being a grumpy Christian who's just ragging on humanity and who doesn't want anyone to be happy. So if that's true, here's another test for you. Okay, here's a social experiment that I've been conducting in recent months, obviously in preparation for this sermon because I think that far ahead. Next time you disagree with someone on something, and you guys are talking about it, and the other person is expressing their opinion, in the middle of them talking, just say, wrong. (laughs) Wrong. I don't agree with you. And then watch how they respond. And then you tell me if people don't want to be right all the time. If people don't want to be in control of the situation all the time. That exposes that in my own heart when someone does that to me. (laughs) Because deep inside of us all is a desire to be right, to be in control, and to be Lord. That's the reality that Psalm 2 is telling us here. And that's the air we breathe, right? In America, we love individualism. We love self-determination. You can make of your life what you want it to be. We have the ability, the American dream, right? If you work hard, you can do whatever you want. That's what we've grown up in, that we are the kings and queens of our own lives. Our sin gets us to think that if I had total control or if people just listened to me, then everything would be okay and there would be no problems, right? If that person moved over from the left lane, my day would be better, the world would be a better place. The desire of our flesh is to be the one on the throne, but what if we're bad kings and queens? Right, you guys have seen The Lion King, I'm assuming. If you have, if you haven't, then you should just go watch it, because that's like a classic. But if you have, then you're familiar with what happens when Scar, Mufasa's evil brother, takes over the kingdom. Right? Somehow he changes the ecology of the land. Everything is gray. Everything is dead. Everybody's sad. There's no water. There's no life. Right? That's what happens when somebody who isn't the rightful king takes over the land. He's not a good king and he's not the right king. And what Psalm 2 is telling us is that we are scar in this scenario. When we try to take control of our lives, when we try to determine ourselves what is right and wrong, we are trying to act as the unrightful and unrighteous judge. What Psalm 2 is telling us, and that's the second point in the sermon, is that there is a better king than us on the throne. There's a better king for us on the throne. And maybe we tend to feel like we want to be in control of our lives and the way we live our lives. And maybe we feel like obedience to Christ is a restriction on our joy. And maybe we think that because we don't actually have a good idea of how good this king is. And so here are three ways that Jesus is a better king than us. You guys ready for this? Number one, God chose him to be king. Verse six tells us that. God chose him to be king. Do you know the significance of that? God is good, God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, and everything he does is good, and that also means that God never makes a mistake. And as a good God, God chose a good king for the universe, Jesus. And every one of us has something that disqualifies us from being a good authority over others, whether that's quickness to anger, impatience, jealousy, selfishness, Fear, like that people-pleasing fear, that's not a good fear, right? Every one of us has something that would make us bad 
lords. But Jesus has none of that. Jesus is perfect. And Jesus is perfect in goodness and kindness and grace and power and wisdom. And he has never done a single thing wrong, ever. And despite all of that, despite all of his goodness, Jesus died for us that we could enjoy him forever if we call on his name. This leads us to the second way that Jesus is a better king over our lives than, that, than us. And that's number two, he's better because he resurrected. He rose from the dead. Verse seven talks about, there's kind of that line where it's like, you are my son, today I've become your father. Well, in the book of Acts, Paul says that that's actually talking about Jesus' resurrection. Right? When Jesus rose from the dead, this was a proclamation to the world that Jesus is the Son of God and he has defeated death. And when it comes down to it, that's our greatest enemy, right? Death. And here's how we know that it's our greatest enemy. I want you to run through whatever the thing is that you're anxious about in your mind right now. Right? It might be like, if I don't get this job, or I don't get into this school, then X is going to happen next, this thing is going to happen next, and then after that, then this thing will happen, and then I'll die. Right? If I don't get this job, I'm not going to get the, the, if I don't get this internship, I'm not going to get the job, I'm not going to pay my bills, I'm going to be homeless, I'm going to be hungry, and then I'm going to die. If you follow every single one of your anxieties to their logical end, death is the end, because death is the ultimate enemy of man. But Jesus, after dying on the cross for us, he rose from the dead on the third day, defeating that death. And while we have no power over our biggest enemy or fear, Jesus has totally defeated it already for us. So that death will have no sting. And because Jesus defeated the ultimate enemy of man, then there's not a single thing that a Christian can encounter that has a greater say over your life than Jesus does. Your biggest fear and your biggest anxiety is not more definitive in how your life turns out than Jesus is. He is Lord of all. There is no fear or uncertainty in your life that has more authority than him. And that leads us to our third way that he's a better fit than the throne than us is because he has all the power. Verse 8 and 9 talks about God giving all the nations over to him, all the authority over to him. And we like to act like we're in control, but I've sat down with enough of you guys when it's midterms week or finals week to know how in control you guys really are. When you're feeling anxious, you know, we've all been there and you're sweating, pitting out. <clears throat> we are not in control. And the truth is that we're never actually in control, even if we have the perception of that. But Jesus, Jesus actually is in control always. And not a single thing ever happens that's outside of Jesus' control. Every nation, every corner of the earth, every person, there's not a single thing that will be able to stand against Jesus when he returns, which is a promise in the Bible, by the way. It's not a possible thing that will happen. Everything has been given over to Jesus, every single thing. So if you want to experience the full joy of Christianity, here's the application. You ready for it? Just surrender yourself to the good king and worship him. And when you don't know what's going on and you don't understand and it feels like the rug's been pulled out from underneath, underneath of you, surrender everything over to Jesus and just trust him and worship him. Because Jesus is the good king. But we need to see something because in verse 9, David says something really interesting. What David says is that this king is going to break these rebels with an iron scepter. And he is going to shatter them like pottery. Verse 9 ends with a promise that all people will be brought to submission and that that will either happen joyfully or forcefully. And that's the third point of the sermon, is that at the end of the day, every knee bows to Jesus. 
every knee, every person who has ever lived on that day when Jesus returns will bow their knee to Jesus. And that will be the best day for some lives and the worst for others because that will mean that judgment to either heaven or hell is near. And here's the tension that that creates in my heart. Is doesn't that sound like a threat? Doesn't it sound like the Bible is putting a gun to your head and telling you to submit? Because what we've been talking about is how following Jesus is a true joy, not a repression of joy, but how can anything be truly joyful if it's done with that gun to your head? If it's done out of that fear? And I would say that's a great question. And that's where the rest of Psalm 2 comes in. Because we need to see the heart of our God. Verse 10 through 12, David continues. He says, So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the sun or he will be angry and you will perish in your rebellion for his anger may ignite at any moment and all who take refuge in him are happy. Here's a difference, not the difference, a difference between us and God. When somebody wrongs one of us, our tendency is to want to keep being mad. Even if you're a peacekeeper like me and you like hate confrontation, you hate feeling like you're at odds with somebody, there's still a part of you where even if that person comes to apologize for a little bit, you're like, I'm actually not ready to let go of this anger. Like I almost want to be angry. But what we see here is that God doesn't want that. What God wants is true redemption and true reconciliation. God wants us to be made right with him. God doesn't tell us the dire situation we're in and then say, good luck. What God says to us is, do not be dumb. Come to me. Don't perish in your rebellion. Choose life. In short, turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus. And so rather than chains and bondage, this is actually what the Christian life is marked by. And here are three invitations. It's marked by three invitations that we see here. Invitation number one. Verse 11 tells us, be in awe. Be in awe of God. Isn't that an amazing first invitation? You've seen the power and the authority of God, and you've seen that he's not someone to be messed with, And yet God is like, why don't you just stand back and watch and just enjoy watching how powerful I am. What the psalmist says is that this awe, it's going to lead to service to the Lord. As as we are more in awe of him, we want to serve him and follow him more. So I was trying to think of what an illustration of that might be. So here's, here's the closest thing you got. You guys ready for this? You guys seen Looney Tunes? Bring in all the kids' references. This is a video I watched this week. There's a scene where Bugs Bunny is just sitting, minding his own business, and a scent floats out the window of someone having made a pie or something, and he just gets picked up in midair, and he just starts floating, following the scent, right to where the food is, and then he sits down at the table, and he just starts enjoying. That's what it is in our Christian life. You see the goodness of God, and what you notice as you see the goodness and the sweetness of our Lord is that you just begin to follow him joyfully, willfully. As we experience the goodness of God and are in awe of who he is through time in the word, through conversations with other Christians, as we live out in faithfulness, we will find that we naturally are serving the Lord not in some shallow amazement like you would binge watch some TV show, but in reverential awe of who God is. That's the first invitation is to be in awe. The second invitation is to rejoice with trembling. That's in verse 11. 
So here's the question. How can you rejoice and be scared at the same time? Easy. So about a year and a half ago, proposed to my now wife. As she is pulling up in the car, I am simultaneously unbelievably excited because I'm about to get engaged. While at the same time, I'm pitting out and I'm feeling the weight of the moment because I'm about to ask somebody a question that I have never asked anybody in my life. How can we be joyful and trembling at the same time? That's how you do it. You feel the weight of joy. It's not shallow. It is weighty. The invitation of the Christian is to invite Jesus to show you a joy that's unlike anything you've experienced, a weighty joy, because it's the joy that we were made to experience in the first place. Psalm 2 invites us to be in awe and to deeply rejoice. But then verse 12 gives us that warning again, right? It's like, you better pay homage to the sun. Some of your translations might say, you better kiss the sun, right? Like, you better respect him or else you will perish. And it's almost like, oh, man, it's kind of a buzzkill. We were just getting to the good stuff. And it kind of reintroduces that tension, right? Because what Psalm 2 is saying is if you don't turn to Jesus, you will die in your rebellion. And we tend to live in a time where truth is super subjective and you can just kind of believe whatever you want. But what the Bible is telling us is that this is absolutely true. Like every single person who does not turn to Jesus, by the end of their life, they will perish in their rebellion. And so if that's true, doesn't that recreate the tension that we talked about? How can something be truly joyful if there's a gun to your head? Well, it doesn't, and here's why. Because that same son who will judge the earth is the same son who came to die for every single one of us while we were still sinning. When we weren't asking for it, when we were holding out a stiff arm to him because we wanted nothing to do with him. Romans 5 tells us that while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. And that's the third invitation, is to experience happy refuge experience happy refuge in Jesus. The destiny of every single person who turns to Jesus is happiness. That is our eternal destiny. It's eternal happiness. If you are a Christian, that is the arc of your life. Yeah, we'll have some really hard trials in this life for being Christians, for being faithful to the Lord. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of tears Yeah, we're going to go through some really, really good moments and some really, really hard moments. But at the end of the day, that arc of our life ends in a happiness like we cannot imagine. All who take refuge in him are happy. To find happy refuge in the Savior who saw us in all of our brokenness and our true chains of sin. And that that Savior died so that we could experience the fullness of joy in him. Man, that is the ultimate invitation for us. Is will we set aside? And this was kind of my like conviction as I was reading this. was like, man, will I set aside all of my plotting for control over my life and the lives of the people around me? Will I set that aside? And while I set aside all of my plotting for God's throne to be the Lord of my own life, will I set that aside? And will I joyfully surrender everything to the one who invites me into eternal happiness? That's the invitation for us tonight. Would you guys pray with me? Lord Jesus, man, we are just so in awe that we get to open your word, that we get to hear from you and worship you, and Jesus, that we get to just experience happy refuge in you. Lord, our flesh and our sin and Satan all just want to convince us that life is found where sin is found. 
But Jesus, what you tell us is that true life is found where you are. And God, we praise you that that's true, that you have brought us from death to life to know you and to worship you. And God, if there's anybody in this room who doesn't know you like that, God, we ask that right now they would come to know you like that, that they would surrender everything they have to the king who loved them and died for them. And Jesus, for any of your saints who are feeling that tension, feeling like this Christian life is more chains than joy, God, and just remind them of who you are right now and what that means for us. Jesus, we love you and pray that we would leave this room more in awe of you than we were when we came here. It's in your name that we pray, amen.